this is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 79 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking to Amy Mertz all about story brand, how story brand can help you, how you can incorporate it into your marketing and your book selling, and all of that good stuff. But first, to last week's question, which was, what are your quarter two goals? First, we have Kerry Hardesky, who said, my Q2 goals are to continue outlining uh, and first drafting my series as much as I can. I'm three chapters into book four, and I'm trying to finish that ASAP because I have no idea what comes next. Then we have Jackie Rita, who says, my quarter two goal is to draft my next nonfiction book. Uh, Ian Worrell says get my novel and novelette ready for publication Erin McKnight says this quarter I want to finish all of my editing and send my manuscript off to my editor for round two just putting that in words makes me nervous I've only received the first half back so far due to some crazy life events they have been forced to delay at least they were able to get me part of it back so I could get started not got any major plot issues that require massive rewrites, so yay for that. Uh, Zach Jeffroy says, great episode, uh, things I'll be putting to use. Quarter two, quarter two goals include create some second generation Amazon ads, put the finishing touches on a second edition, edit another book, finish another book, throw my biggest promo in order to take my first book wide. Oof, that's exciting. Edwin says, I've been making measurable progress getting back into the developmental edits of my whip. I want to be in the next stage by the end of quarter two. This week's question is, are you wide or are you in KU and why? All right, and on that train of thought, my book recommendation for the week this week is Wide for the Win by Mark Lefebvre. Hopefully, most of you have now either caught or caught the replay of the Q&A session that I did with Mark in the Rebel Authors Facebook group. And holy actual shit, I learned so much from that session. Um, and yeah, so you guys need to get yourself a copy of the book and and um, yeah, get reading. All right, in personal update news then, don't forget that the Rebel Author Diaries Anthology submissions are now open and uh, you can find out more information at sashablack.co.uk forward slash rebel submissions. In what I deem as super fucking exciting news, I finished my Oh my goodness me, I just cannot begin to tell you how happy I am that I have now finished uh, what is officially Eight Steps to Side Characters, How to Craft Supporting Roles with Intention, Purpose and Power. Now, um, it is only the first draft that I have finished. I am going to be resting it for like a week or so, uh, and then I will go and start to edit it. There are some chapters that still need a bit of work. Um, I just got so exhausted by the end of the book, but also I needed to like hit the finish line. <laughs> so um, I know there's like one small section that needs a bit of work, and, and I suspect there'll be some other sections that need work by the time I come uh, to give it a good edit. Then I'll be shipping it to uh, beta readers, then I'll do their edits, then it will go off to the editor, which I have booked for mm, around, or will, will hopefully be booking for around uh, the middle of May, which means I should be launching um, either at the end of June or at the end of July, just depending on how like the next few weeks goes. This like completion is emotionally so what I needed right now. I made the mistake of opening too many tabs. So like I have uh, the third book in my 
young adult fantasy series and a fourth book which is a novella both are drafted both are sitting there waiting to be edited and then once I've done that I will also have the box set so these are those are things that are like tabs open and unfinished I also have um obviously side characters and the workbook so that between that that's four books plus you know two box sets that are all open and unfinished and then I've got the villains audiobook which is half done and then I've also got the scent of death which I'm I don't know 10 12k into which is open and I'm now skinny drafting and working on that as well so I have way too many tabs open and um I've also been like creating course outlines and things in the background and I just need to finish something oh lest lest we also forget I'm also working on my own anthology story and none of these fucking things are finished and much as I really like to have multiple projects and work on lots of different things even I get oversaturated at some points even I of course everybody gets oversaturated what do you want about Sasha but like the point that I'm trying to make is I definitely have oversaturated myself and I have opened too many tabs and like mentally I am struggling um with the lack of achievement because I have too many things open and working on all of them everything is slowed because I'm not focused on one thing and just smashing that out to completion so this next quarter for me is really about trying to finish all of these things off so you know hold myself accountable um by the end of this quarter I really want to have like Trey and Sirens which is book three and then the novella book four edited and like ready for publication side characters textbook and workbook edited and ready for publication uh the box sets of both formatted my anthology short story done the villains audiobook done and then if possible I would also like to have a skinny draft of the scent of death but I think that's probably the one that will get shunted into quarter three but anyway even if I can get all of those other things done I will be super pleased that it does mean though that's going to be a bit of a grueling quarter because it will be full of editing which is not my favorite part of the process I much prefer drafting even though I've just finished a draft and <laughs> that ruling so you know what like maybe I just like having written as opposed to the fucking process of trying to get a goddamn book done um no I jest I kind of jest like we all know what it's like sometimes there are euphoric moments sometimes there's hysteria like right now because I'm clearly hysterically tired uh yeah anyway yeah I am basically deliriously happy with having finished something something so yes what I am hoping for off the back of this uh book draft completion is that the finishing energy high that I've got from it will roll me over <laughs> roll me over <laughs> what kind of phrase is that oh my god clearly I need some coffee this morning oh uh what I meant to say <laughs> is that I hope it will t- like tide me over. I literally don't know what I'm saying oh my God. this is a f- clusterfuck of a podcast what I mean is that I'm hoping it will carry me through and help me to finish all of these other fucking open tabs that's basically what I'm trying to say okay let's move on the rebel of the week this week is Dharma Kellia Keller I'm um, oh, sorry if I have said your name wrong please do email me and let me know um okay so Dharma says I came out as transgender about 30 years ago in Atlanta America's deep south a very conservative place now even more so back then but I didn't care I was a 20 something trans woman determined to live my truth I'm also one of the first people in the States to donate a kidney to a stranger way back in the late 1990s. I'd been sober for about a year at the time and living a life of gratitude when I learned that someone in Tuscan about 100 miles southeast of where I now live in Phoenix needed a kidney. I said yes. I didn't know anything about them, not their gender, race, age or sexual orientation. I just knew they needed one and I had to and I had to do it and I did and I have no regrets. I love that so much. I love that this is a story of empowerment, of finding and being able to like be yourself and 
be yourself despite your um, circumstances and like the locational situation and the fact that you are in such a conservative um, area. I know I grew up in a conservative area and uh, like I came out of the closet and then went back in the closet and then had to come out again at uni for very similar reasons. So yeah, I love a story of um, like empowerment and, and just like, yeah, empowered rebellion. Fuck yeah. Okay. So I have changed this weekly message uh, because I've decided, uh, I think I mentioned it a few podcasts ago, quite a few podcasts ago now, that I'm not really engaging with Twitter anymore. Um, and so I'm more or less off Twitter completely. I only check it about once a week. Uh, so a much better way to contact me is uh, Instagram. So... If you would like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of uh, rebellion, big, small, or somewhere in between. You can email your story to rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or you can get me on Instagram at Sasha Black Author. Okay, a whopping three new patrons this week. Welcome and a humongous thank you to Nathan Scammell, Heather Adame Sayanez, uh, and Maninda Gaynor. I really, really appreciate your support. And um, yeah, like, I don't know. I just want to say a whopping massive thank you. I know that um, times are difficult now and you guys not only make me feel like what I do is worthwhile. Yeah, you're basically funding me to swear more, which is my favourite thing in the world. And you help to like financially keep the podcast going. So yeah, guys, I really do appreciate it. And of course, that goes for all of my existing patrons too. And there is going to be another uh, Poison and Prose in April, which is exclusive and just for patrons. And that is going to be on the 14th of April. So uh, you can join uh, me and support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, as well as like bonus content and opportunities from as little as $2 a month. And don't forget your uh, Rebel uh, Anthology submission will count twice um, if you are a patron. And you can do all of that from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. Alrighty, let's get on with the interview. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I am joined by somebody I have known for a really long time and genuinely thought we had already met. And then as we got on uh, to our podcast session, I realised that we actually hadn't. But this is the wonderful world of the internet and, you know, the 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 fact that it makes a very large world very small. So yes, I like props to the internet today and, and the wonderful connections. Um, that it can help to make. So I am joined by Amy Mertz. Amy has been bouncing around the world, oh, sorry, bouncing around the world, bouncing around the working world for the past 18 years, doing everything from teaching music to working in college admissions to news writing. She was searching for a unicorn, a job that paid actual money, allowed her to write for a living, and didn't involve talking to hordes of people. That really is a unicorn. Uh, it took a move to the Midwest with her husband and three-week-old son. Holy shit, three weeks you moved. But she finally found it. She is the creative director and story brand guide at IFC Studios, a branding agency in Iowa, and cat mum to HRH, Her Royal Highness, the Lady Mirabel. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Sasha. <laughs> no, it's an absolute pleasure. And it's so lovely to like finally connect as well after all of these months and years. And it's so strange. Like I'm always reminded how bizarre the internet is when you when you have spoken to somebody so much for so long and then you're like wait I actually haven't ever spoken to you and I, you know normally I'd be shitting myself and terrified like to get on get on a zoom with somebody new but yeah I'm just like yeah we're all friends it's fine <laughs> <laughs> no I totally agree it's so funny how it can be so cool like that and also you know do spam accounts in your name you know? yeah I know <laughs> yeah I know so I have since found two more spam accounts as well and I'm just like oh for fuck's sake I don't really I don't really know what I can do about it I know that you can submit to get verification but I don't think my like Instagram account is big enough for them to actually bother doing that but um I suppose if they if I continue to get the spam accounts maybe they will I don't know 
I don't know. Anyway, fuck that. Tell everyone a little bit about you and how you got to where you are today and the madness of moving when you have a three three week old baby. Oh yeah. No, that was not um, my favorite thing. I actually <laughs> had like my pregnancy had been kind of a weird one. And then uh, my husband got a job. He's a uh, marching dir- band director at the University of Northern Iowa out here. So three weeks uh, after I had uh, my child, we moved out to Iowa where we have no family. So it was, the whole thing is, was madness, but we have made it through. So that's cool. Um, as far as how I got where I am today, I definitely ter- took the circuitous route. I have a mas- master's and a bachelor's degree in music education because I decided in middle school that I wanted to be a music teacher and I was laser focused on that goal all to college. I wanted to be the best possible candidate to be a music teacher. Uh, and then I taught for a couple of years and I found out I didn't like it. So mm-hmm. obviously I doubled down and got a master's degree in it as well. Uh, <laughs> and then after that, I sort of started the very slow, intense, exhausting, anxiety riddled journey of moving myself back to a job in which I could write full time. And uh, finally, I have it here as I do a lot of my writing through StoryBrand. And so what instrument is your is your instrument? Uh, clarinet is my primary instrument. Mm. And what about your husband? Bassoon. You would never know it to meet him, but <laughs> I see. I see fire. now. Yeah, I see why you get on now. <laughs> Okay, so we are here to talk about StoryBrand. So what the actual fuck is StoryBrand and why do authors need it anyway? Yeah, so um, this is a good question. Not totally obvious, I guess. But I mean, <laughs> uh, StoryBrand is basically, it's a, it's a marketing framework that was created by a man named Donald Miller. He had been a memoirist for a while and then he moved into the business space. Uh, we have analogs for this kind of thing in the writing world, like there's the snowflake method of writing your novel. This is the story brand method for creating your marketing message. It's a way of taking elements of the hero's journey and um, converting them into your marketing message to attract the ideal readers in this case. Um, The idea behind it is that we have been telling stories forever. Mm. And we didn't just tell them for entertainment, we told them to have people remember lessons. Uh, And because story is such a good vehicle for memory, it makes a really good vehicle for your marketing message. So do you sometimes base it on the heroine's journey as well? Sure. So, um, so whoever, whoever your ideal person is, uh, whoever your ideal reader is, that is the hero heroine of your story. Okay. Okay. So, so, and so not directly connected to like story arc in terms of hero and heroine, because I've just um, finished reading the heroine's journey by Gail Carragher. um, But that is very much about uh, like, story arc in a novel so I wasn't sure whether or not it was overlaid directly or more about like the central character I suppose yeah so there's there's like seven uh sort of story points that you hit along the way uh but they can apply to anybody who you are marketing to essentially okay 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 so how can writers then incorporate story brand into their marketing so, uh, so story brand brand is the plan. So, from a small set of elements, you can build pretty much all of your content. Um, well, not all of your content. There's not like a story brand gremlin in your computer. It's busting <laughs> out all your blog posts or anything like that. But uh, if you need to do an ad or an email or your website copy or social media posts, um, any any of that can really be pulled out of your story brand framework. And so. Like what, can you um, talk me through some of like the steps? So can you, like, I'm going to swap and chop and change the questions around. So like, can you give me, an ex- give me an example of story brand, like, and how it works in practice? Like what are the steps in the, the journey to creating your story brand? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, there are seven, um, seven parts of the framework. And when you complete that, you have something called a brand script, but the seven elements are Number one, a character. Two, has a problem. Three, meets a guide. Four, who gives them a plan. 
five, and calls them to action, six, helps them avoid failure, seven, and meet with success. Mm-hmm. So that's the general arc. Now, if you wrote that as a novel, that would be a totally boring novel if you just hit those points. But from a marketing standpoint, it makes a very clear message. Okay. And so can you work that through in practice, like, and give an example of how like one author or one, um, like one brand you would do it, you would do it with a brand? Yes, actually <laughs> I did. I did a brand script and a sales email actually out for side characters. If that's okay. okay. Yeah, right. that's super exciting. Well, I mean, I'm going to understand fully, hopefully everybody else. Okay. So for everybody who's, um, who's listening, who, who has no idea why Amy has chosen side characters, I am writing a book, um, called well see I have the the cover on my wall except I've already changed the number of steps but anyway eight steps to is it eight or nine I have some um, random number of steps to side characters how to craft supporting roles with intention purpose and power so essentially I am looking at uh, my my next non-fiction book which I've always finished is looking at um how to help you guys write characters that are um, everything other than your hero and your villain. Yes. And uh, I should also mention that Sasha and I have not talked about this. If she was really going through the story brand process, then uh, we would have gone back and forth many times and and done some tweaking probably. Uh, So all I have done is infer knowledge from the times I've heard about this on the Facebook group, on her Instagram, Um, she may have taken a different direction, but this is a version that could work for a book like side characters. So, Mm -hmm. uh, so part one, a character wants to take their writing to the next level. Easy. Or write better side characters. Okay. So, and so this is already, already let's stop because I think the point is here rather than um, a writer thinking about the characters in the book that they are promoting. Look, see, I told you my fucking cat would scratch the door. She's already (laughs) scratching the door. Um, Rather than thinking about um, a character within their book, what you're doing is you're talking about the purchaser, the reader, the customer. So in writers marketing you guys need to be thinking about the like reader and uh, the audience rather than about you as the author or about the characters in the book absolutely yes in this case through story brand your reader is the hero is the character in this story you will be the guide in this story interesting yeah, okay yeah, so you're like Gandalf the Grey Oh, hell yes. If only I could be Maleficent. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You can be everybody else. Okay. 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 (laughs) Um, So yeah, so they they want to take their writing to the next level. That's their, the character. Um, They have a problem. They actually have three problems. They have an external problem, an internal problem, and a philosophical problem. So their external problem I just decided was that there are so many sources of information out there that their internal problem is they feel overwhelmed and their philosophical problem is, shouldn't I be able to find all the information about this that I need in one place? And if everybody remembers only one thing I say from this podcast, it is this people buy external goods and services for internal reasons. So Mm. I feel afraid in my house. So I will buy this alarm system. I am disgusted by the leak in my basement that's putting sewage into my basement. I will pay for the service of this plumber who says he's going to be here in 10 minutes. Every single decision that somebody makes about buying anything is based on some internal feeling. And if you can identify that, you have done a lot of work towards getting better sales. So like something like, um, I feel like all my characters sound the same, or I feel like all my characters appear the same on the page or that kind of, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So depending on how you're setting this all up, that could be something. So I feel frustrated that Mm. all my characters seem the same. All my characters are one dimensional, whatever that might be. So Mm -hmm. that could be another way to kind of set this up. So we have your character, we have their problems. They meet a guide. Enter Sasha Black. Oh, hello, everyone. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) 
you need, need to demonstrate two things, empathy and authority. So empathy. I was where you were. That's why I wrote this book. I also wanted all this information distilled down into, you know, some easy steps for me. Um, your authority. I've written many fiction and craft related books and have gained the respect of my peers and readers. So obviously you would have more things probably under empathy and more things under authority. You have lots of things to speak to your authority. That's just the one I pulled. So as their guide, you're going to give them a plan and it's going to be a really bare bones, simple plan. Step one, read Sia characters. Step two, put those tips into action. Step three, start getting those five-star reviews. And I do understand that there are actually lots of steps between <laughs> step two and step three, but you're painting a picture of success here. You mm -hmm. want, you would not put that book out into the world if you did not think it would help somebody improve their writing. So it is okay to paint a picture of success. Um, it's not a false bill of goods. That is your intention, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so after they have their plan, you call them to action. Your direct call to action is buy side characters or buy this book or buy it now. This is something most people, and I feel like writers more than anybody, are very uncomfortable doing. They feel it's very salesy and nobody likes to be sold to and nobody likes to feel like they're selling. But the thing that StoryBrand does that's a little bit different is because it has couched your reader as the hero, uh, it's not really salesy. It's really, I understand where you're coming from. I have been there before. I have the tools to help you. Let me help you. If you buy this book, I can help. You will feel less overwhelmed. You will feel less frustrated. You will have that relief, right? So it's not as salesy when you put it together this way. So. I think it's like that vulnerability, isn't it? Because every writer I think I've ever met suffers from imposter syndrome. And, you know, I, I still suffer with imposter syndrome, even though I can see the reviews on my books. I know that they're good books. I get people telling me that they've helped them improve their prose or their writing or their characters or their villains or whatever. And still, I feel... <laughs> terrified every single time I put a book out I, I'm like what if I'm not funny anymore what if my <laughs> jokes are shit what if I haven't explained this thing correctly what if my diagrams rubbish or whatever um and so yeah like it is I definitely think that sales that ability to sell is something that you grow into as a writer but I'm not sure I don't know if I'll ever feel a hundred percent comfortable because like this sounds ridiculous, but I genuinely spend a lot of my time in denial about the fact that my books are read. Like I don't, I would prefer, I mean, obviously I need my books to be read to pay my mortgage, but like, I would prefer, I don't know. Like, I just wish I didn't, I just wish, I don't know. I don't want to say it. Cause obviously like I want my books to be read, but also it's so hard like to know that fact and to push and to like ask and make the request. I don't know why. I just, yeah, I think it's, it's because we, it's because we make ourselves vulnerable, right? I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's a, there's a piece of you, whether you, you base a character on you or not, um, there's a piece of you in every single one of those books. And, and if somebody rejects that, they feels like they've rejected a piece of you, right? Yeah. Um, I actually remember when I was reading Victor, one of our first conversations, I was reading Victor and I told you I was near the end. You were like, oh, I can't believe you're reading this. I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I struggle so much more when people read the fiction. I, uh, yeah, I definitely try and, and block that out. I, um, yeah, it, and you know, it's even worse now I've written nonfiction uh, to know that people are reading the fiction, especially because Keepers was the first fiction book that I put out. And I wrote that like, I don't even know how many years ago, I think I started writing it. I know, when did I publish it? 2017. It's like I published it four years ago, which means I wrote it five years ago. Well, my writing is so different now. It's mm -hmm. really hard to know that I still haven't put put like finished that series and put out the new stuff that I know is so much better so I spend a lot of my time this is completely irrelevant to this podcast but <laughs> I spend a lot of my time like really this is why I'm struggling to put um Trey and, and Sirens out but um I spend so much of my time frustrated because I have to continue writing in that voice in because then I can't change the, the brand or the tone or the style of that series like I have to finish the series in the voice 
that I started it with. But anyway, anyway, uh, what step were we on? We were on the guide. Uh, Did we do we're the guide? On, we're on, uh, yeah, five. So call them to action. Um, so think of it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, people get information, and this is the last thing I'll say about you know, direct calls to action. People get a lot of information thrown at them every day. Some they are choosing to consume, some they are not really choosing to consume. It's just thrown in them. They have to sift through a lot of stuff and they have to make a lot of decisions. So adding direct call to action, telling people how to do business with you, it actually, believe it or not, puts their mind at ease. They think, okay, I have decided this person can help me. This is how I need to proceed. I'll just do that, right? You don't think of it that way, but it actually is, is a helpful thing. Yeah. And I think I'm just going to throw one last thing out that the one thing that I always ask myself is, am I personally proud of this thing that I have created? And or that's the only question I can ask myself at the time. I will not publish a book that I don't think is good enough. And yes, you move on from where you are at that time and you get better but at the time I always ask myself you know listeners should ask themselves are you proud of this book if you're proud of it then you should then the, then you shouldn't be afraid to say buy my book yes exactly so true um and and because you are proud of this book part of this journey is is leading people who read it to some kind of success so in the case of side characters start raking in those great Amazon reviews or um, gain the respect of your peers and readers or uh, ask people to create spin-offs of your side characters uh, for, you know, make their own novels out of the side characters. They're so well developed that they want to see more. Um, so those could be elements of success or if they don't buy side characters, they might continue to feel like they could be a better writer or they could be dinged in their reviews for one dimensional characters or they keep writing black cluster side characters. So, so when you have all of those elements together, when you have those seven parts laid out, creating your message, whatever that might be, an email, um, a, a social media post. So for example, like, um, wouldn't it be cool if your side characters were so good that people wanted spinoffs? That would be in the success. I know there's a lot of information out there. That's the external problem. So I've distilled it down into this one book to level up your writing. That is the character want, buy it today direct call to action. Oh, I love this framework has just written that whole thing for you, right? And I also, I, I'm not going to read this here. I did write you a sales email example as well. Um, we'll talk later about, we have a little freebie that we're going to give you and I'm going to shoot, I'm going to put this great brand script and the email in the freebie for people to read if they want to read it, but just amazing. Yeah, we, we will definitely sort that out. So if you are listening and then you will, at the time this goes out, you will be able to get it in the show notes. So make sure you do go and download that. Okay, so what mistakes then do people make uh, when trying to use story brand in their marketing? Sure. So, so the first one we already have talked about, that direct call to action. That's a, a generally a mistake I see people try and pull away from. Another one is trying to be clever. Uh, which I think as, as writers, we fall into this trap a lot. I work with a guy who um, sells concrete for a living. He didn't care about being clever. But as writers, we care because clever writing is, is interesting and beautiful writing. We want to do that all, right? But in order to sort of bring the noise level down for your readers, clear trumps clever every time from a marketing message perspective. Keep clever in your writing, your actual writing, and you can market very clearly. Uh, and the other thing is trying to pack in too much information. I think this comes from a place of people um, not wanting to leave out any segment of their population with their message. But I worked, um, I was working with somebody who had a med spa and we were trying to create a one-liner, kind of like an elevator pitch for her. And she kept wanting to put in all the different services that she was going to offer. This comes from a totally good and normal place, but the purpose of your elevator pitch is really to give people an idea of the problem you're solving. How are you improving their lives full stop so that then people say, tell me more about that, right? Um, you don't have to add in every single book you've ever read, written, you know, everything mm -hmm. that you want to put in. It doesn't all have to be in. Leave some stuff out and put it where it is appropriate in your you know, merch on your merch page or in your about section or whatever it might be. 
Have you got some examples of really good, um, like hooky things? <laughs> I can't think of what it is. Or like, what did you use for that lady? Are you allowed to tell us what you used for the lady or? I sure could if I knew where to find it. I, or, I know where to find it. Or the it. concrete guy, was that, wasn't there one with the... So... And about the neighborhood. Yes, I, I remember reading that about um, like the one-liner with the guy who does the, the concrete. Yes. I have him. So he's one liner. Well, and do you have the one that he said before? Like, I think you gave me in, in the, when we talked, I think you gave me one, like what, what he could have said or what he wanted to say. And then like, what, what you ended up saying. Oh yeah. Um, oh, what did I, what did he want to say? Uh, so basically he, he, he wasn't think, he was thinking of himself as the hero. Uh, so that was sort of the, the issue that we were talking through. And when I sort of mentioned the idea that he is not the hero, that he's the guide, everything really shifted from, for him, not just through story brand, but from a business perspective, he started to really think of his business, business in a different way. Um, but his, his work is in concrete. He does driveways, he does sidewalks and things like that. But what he really does is high end patio. He does these concrete stamps and things like that. Um, so that's really the, the person he wanted to attract. So his tagline is not like, we can make your sidewalk. It's be the envy of the neighborhood. Uh, Cause those are the kinds of people that he wanted to attract. And for his one liner, um, we realized that because that was the person uh, and that kind of person has a fair amount of dis disposable income, not, not super rich, um, but they have money to spend on something nice. People spend a lot of time pinning inspiration for their projects, but get overwhelmed figuring out how to execute them. At Iowa Flatworks, we have the expertise and the tools to turn your patio, walkway, or other concrete projects into durable, beautiful space that will make you the envy of the neighborhood. Full stop does not talk about every single service that he has, does not talk about every single detail of his business. That is what people need to know in the beginning. Mm, be the envy of your neighbor, neighborhood. I love that. I love that so much. When I read that, I was like, oh, like <laughs> I know that would turn my eye, but that's because I was super competitive, but also like, hey, then that's probably who you're trying to appeal to, right? So <laughs> did your job amazingly. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> we've talked about like the framework, um, um, but what are like the key elements a writer should include uh, in their story brand? So I suppose thinking about it from like a writing perspective and a writer, and obviously we've talked about like the elements um, for the concrete company, but how does this work for a writer? Yeah, so in, it still works the same way it can get a little bit confusing because we are talking about stories and story messages, but really the elements are exactly the same because in this case, your character is your reader. So if you keep laser focused on your reader, who they are, what they're feeling, what would drive them to buy your book and speak to that, that is, that's your roadmap right there. Okay. And so, like, what are the different places that a writer should um, think about this stuff? So we've talked about, um, like, in the, I guess, the book blurb. And we've talked about, um, like, you know, sort of, I guess, like social media posts promoting, like, the launch of the book. Um, uh, are there any other places, like, should we do it in our email? Should we do it, um, like, in... I don't know, like in our Instagram post, should we like, should we just do this everywhere? Or um, should it just be restricted for the blurb and the sales email? Or like, yeah, like how far can this go? It can go really far because what you do through the framework is you really distill your message down into something essential that would then appeal to anybody who might interact with you by your book. Um, now, obviously, if you're writing an article or something like that, and it's content specific, you're going to just talk about the content, but reframing your brain into thinking, how is the thing that I'm offering helping other people? Um, and that could be through entertainment. You're, if you're writing a fantasy novel, we're not talking about like, oh, it'll make you write better side characters. Obviously not. But that's an there's a, an entertainment escapist value to that as well. So thinking about 
how that is affecting your reader and thinking about um, framing that that way rather than I wrote this book and I'm amazing. <laughs> um, it, I think that really can shift the way we write a lot of our content. Mm. This makes me think about like tropes a bit more and maybe using tropes in my marketing a bit more because that the tropes in my mind, the tropes are the feeling that a reader wants when they come to a book. So for example, one of my um, guilty pleasures is enemies to lovers. Like, oh God, I fucking love an enemy to lover. Like, <laughs> oh, I just love to hate it as well. Like I just, uh, I love the fact that they hate each other. And yet I know they're going to end up bonking <laughs> at the end of the book. Like it's just the best. And so like, if, yeah, like, oh fuck, why have I never thought about this? Like, yeah, I definitely... I think this, yeah, sorry, uh, excuse me whilst I just have some epiphanies over here. Like I'll just continue babbling whilst my brain epiphagizes and just explodes all over this podcast. Um, yeah, using tropes, because that is, I guess, the feelings that, that yeah, wow. Okay, I need a minute. Whew. Um, For what it's worth, also, um, speaking of enemy to lover tropes, I did start watching Bridgerton specifically because oh. I was coming on this podcast and I thought if it comes up, I must know what this is. <laughs> It was so good. I loved Bridgerton. Me and my wife binged it in two nights. And like when, so it took me until the end of the first episode before I was like interested in it. And the first, like, I was just a bit like, what is this shit? Like when we first put it on. And then by the end of the, the first episode, I was like, yeah, where, where's, where's the remote? We need to skip the, skip the intro fluff so that we could just get straight into it. Um, Okay, so where, where, like, let's say a writer is coming to this for the very first time, they're coming to it with their first book, where would they start in trying to create a story brand? Do they, do they start trying to put it into their blur, book blurb? Should they start just trying to cr hit those points? Like, how do you start doing this? Yeah, definitely start with those seven points. Because like, I, I just riffed that um, potential ad or uh, social media post, but I also from that list have created a sales email. I could create the one-liner. I could create a whole series of emails. I could create a blog post about it. Um, having those building blocks, that's why I kind of think of them as building blocks. And when you pick and choose from each of the different building blocks, you can really build a strong but consistent message. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I, th I guess I kind of asked this, like we, I, I don't know if you've got anything else really to add about um, story brand extending outside of like words. C can we wrap this into our branding? Like, I don't know, does color play into emotion? I don't know. I, yeah, I guess, I, I don't know. Talk to me about, I guess, the holistic side of branding and marketing. Like, does it wrap further than just the words that we're using? Yes. So if you had asked me this a couple of weeks ago, I would have answered a little bit differently. Now, where I work, we have four studios, messaging, media, web, and branding. And we have those four studios because we're experts in each of those areas. And we believe strongly that those four elements make a really, really strong brand. If you can unify those elements, then that makes a really strong brand. Um, but I was thinking, actually, uh, I do social media for this company as well. And I found this quote that I wanted to put up. And it was uh, by Jeffrey Zeld Zeldman, yeah, who's an American web designer. And it said, content precedes design. Design in the absence of content is not design, it's a decoration. And I, it was like this mind-blowing moment for me. <laughs> like, like, if your logo and branding, your visual identity, it shouldn't just be a cool thing to look at. It's a representation of all that you are, all that you want to say, everything you want people to know about you. So if you have, like, if your story is not ironed out and crystal clear, it doesn't really matter how cool your branding is because then people will go and they'll see your brand and be like, oh, that's neat. And then they'll move on. But mm -hmm. if it's unified, then that encourages them to keep digging deeper. And honestly, Sasha, your brand is a great example of this. We, we all know everyone who follows you, we know, we know purple, we know villains, we know lampposts, we know, we know <laughs> what to send you all of the time because your brand is so strong. Um, and it's gone, it's, it's, uh, you know, vertical as well as horizontal. So, um, so I, yeah, so I thought, I thought about this and I was like, oh my gosh, it's not just decoration. It's the whole thing. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I love that. It's it's hard though, I think, when you're first big like first starting out to really know what your brand is and what you stand for and what your message is because I definitely didn't know any of these things when I started like the lamppost thing happened by accident and now it's a hundred percent like I don't know if you can see behind me but my mum brought me um little lampposts which are now sort of I have sorry I can appreciate I'm now not facing the mic um I have like a pyramid and my mum brought me these diddy little um lampposts but do you know what you can be fucking damn assured that when it comes to launching that book I will be giving away lampposts like as part (laughs) of the (laughs) like the launch um and yeah like it's so it's yeah I don't know I didn't I definitely don't think I knew what it was I stood for the the purple perhaps was always there from the start but you know the rebellion the swearing all of those things I guess I've grown into but um every time I have made that realization I have then consciously tried to incorporate it into the brand and make it holistic and I will never allow something into the brand that isn't on brand if that makes sense like I have loves and interests that I would never talk about on here because it's just not relevant. Like, and, and so it's knowing what you stand for and then sticking by that rigidly. It's even down to things like recently I changed all my Instagram highlights and now like when I like to be in brand color, but when I write a text-based story on my Instagram story feed, it's only ever on a background that is one of the colors in my brand palette so I just save like a, a, a story gram a st- Instagram story image in, in that color like it's yeah I don't know I I think I secretly have a a a love for branding without really having any expertise in it because I just do it intuitively if that mm-hmm. makes sense I don't know I I find it fascinating my sorry go ahead Oh, I was just going to say one of the things about, about rules. So this is the rebel author podcast and like fuck rules. Right. But, but one of the things about having sort of a, a set of rules is that it makes decision-making a lot easier. Oh, right? so much easier. So you, you know, you know what goes in your brand and you don't, you know, what doesn't go in your brand, you know what to say, and you know, what doesn't fit in what you want to say. Right. So having sort of a loose set of rules is, is good for the brain. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I do completely agree. It, but also it's important because if you are like writing clean romance, for example, then you know that your social media posts and any guest appearances should also be clean. You shouldn't be throwing out fucks and shits and bollockses because that is going to damage your brand because your brand is clean. And therefore it does make certain things easier. Whereas I know I can't really go on (laughs) anything that's, you know, conservatively not uh, rebellious (laughs) because it would be terrible for my brand, Um, (laughs) you know, but yeah, like, yeah, I, I, I really like that. I never realized how much easier that makes my life because I tell you I do suffer with decision fatigue all of the time Mm -hmm. um and yeah it's like you automate things I suppose when you have that guidance and and set of rules okay so I've got a question from a um patron from Cassie Uh, Cassie says uh branding for an author who has multiple upcoming side hustles how do you actually incorporate the ties to various side hustles without losing your identity and core brand okay so yes this this can be difficult definitely um I have a client right now who has a brick and mortar barbershop uh, he actually started a mobile barber shop, but it turned out it was illegal in Iowa. So he got the law changed. It took him like, I think three years, but he got the law changed so that he can offer this mobile barber shop. And hopefully that will be finalized sometime in the next month. However, he's got a story behind the, the mobile shop, which is to serve the underserved. He wants to be able to bring the barbershop experience to people, no matter where they are, if they have physical disabilities, if they want to avoid places with loud noises, whatever is keeping them from coming to the brick and mortar, he wants to be able to serve those people. That is a slightly different story than the brick and mortar, which would serve anybody who would walk in the door. However, the two pieces meet 
with the full barbershop experience. This is idea that he's the barber. He's a, an ear, you know, like a friendly ear. He's uh, he's got the he's got the chair. He's got this. It's it's like a whole experience that a person has within a barbershop that is now physical in a brick and mortar and on the road through the the van and that those are the kinds of things you have to find when you are you have multiple like side hustles essentially um, so if you're an editor and you also have a book you do meet in the middle somewhere because you are you but they don't have to be the exact same message you could kind of do a brand script out for one and for the other and but i i bet they're going to have some crossover because you are you and you have a set of your own personal rules, your own personal ethics and the things you want out there in the universe. Yeah, I love that. And I had to sort of like lean back because I was having another epiphany. One of my biggest issues with my fiction is that it feels so disconnected from the nonfiction. Um, and part of that is because it's young adult. Um, but then I was like, but is it disconnected? Because I have some characters who are super sassy, like I'm thinking of one particular character who's an absolute diva. Um, and, you know, there is swearing in there, although not as much as I would put in if it was an adult book. Mm -hmm. but yeah, like, I, I, that's so true. Like, you can't help being you. And so even though my young, well, this particular young adult series is cleaner than perhaps any adult stuff I would do there are still like those rebellious sassy characters and yeah I love you're making me think so much this evening <laughs> well and also, I mean think about like Nike Nike has like kids stuff and they have basketball stuff and they have football stuff and they have but they're always you always see the swoosh right mm -hmm. even though they're they have adjusted their message depending on what they're trying to target but they're still Nike they always are yeah <laughs> Oh, I love this. Okay, I'm really sad that this that was my last question because I'm finding this so interesting. However, this is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Mm, yeah, so I listened to this podcast, so I knew this was coming. Um, but as an Enneagram 9, I'm like, uh, I'm what's it called? Uh, conflict averse. <laughs> so, so being a rebel is tough for me, but I do have sort of a literary example. Um, my husband and I, we have crossover in the kinds of media and literature that we consume. We are very much in the sort of sci-fi fantasy post-apocalyptic side of things. That's the majority of what we do. So my husband's looking for a new book. He's on Amazon. He's reading the reviews for, I don't know what the book is. He doesn't buy this book because some cheeky reviewers are saying, don't read this book. Go check out a book called Wool by Hugh Howey. Now, Hugh Howey, a lot of your listeners probably will know who he is at this point, but um, at the time he was unknown pretty much. Um, so, so he reads, he buys all five books and he reads them and he comes to me, he says, I've got a story for you. You have got to read Wool by Hugh Howey. So this is on a Sunday. I buy all five books. <laughs> I start reading. I am reading through dinner. I'm reading after dinner. I'm mm. reading at two o'clock in the morning. I fall asleep reading the book. <laughs> and the next day I wake up, I realize I have not finished it, but it, can, it has consumed my brain. I cannot think of a single other thing other than finishing this book. So I called in sick. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I, I tell you what, that is the mark of a real book where somebody is <laughs> called in sick because they had to finish a book. So I didn't know. I haven't read Wool. There's a confession. Oh. I haven't. I wonder if I have. Um... I know you have it because one time I saw it on your shelf and I was like, oh, I love that book. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah. If, I was going to say it's got to be here somewhere. I was sure I had a copy. Um, I'm going to go and look for it after this. So is it really that that gripping? Yeah, so it, um, a part of it is because it's a self-contained universe. Um, there's there's not a lot of straying from the central location. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I think often makes a, a tight story. But his his writing is so descriptive, but there is not a wasted word, and mm. I love that. I loved actually reading it, and I loved the story. It's a I, little depressing though. Uh, Just does it not have a happy ending? Throwing that out there. Uh, if you read everything like everything in the universe then uh then it's okay but I, don't, I can't remember if the fifth book actually there's like the omnibus and then there's shift and then there's dust or something um there's a lot of stuff 
Yeah. Oh, because I thought it was only three books, so I didn't realize it was five. Um, oh, that is a commitment. Five books. Mm, okay. I've just you finished. Have, you the... have not so you have just like you have the book as it's intended to be read. Wool. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I just finished the Broken Earth series. Oh. Uh, have you read it? I have not. I've tried to read it a couple of times and I can't, I'm not going to say why, but the very beginning of the first book wrecks me every time. We'll, I try we'll, to we'll talk about this off, <laughs> off air because I had a very similar experience. Um, okay. But, uh, tell everyone where they can find out more about you. Um, I, have you published yet? Or I don't, I don't know if you've published yet. Uh, no. Okay. I, so your company then. My work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> so your company and your services, I'm guessing authors can use your services as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so for me, I'm on Instagram at Amy Mertz. You can learn about my life and my toddler and my funny cat and my work in progress. Um, but my company, if you want to learn more about uh, branding in general and messaging, things like that, we are big on education. So if my, our Instagram is at IFC studios. And like I mentioned earlier, we do have sort of a combo branding story brand freebie for you guys that is available at ifcstudios.com slash rebel. If you want to check that out amazing and I will include that link in the show notes thank you so much for your time today thank you so much it's nice to officially meet you I know right <laughs> I still can't get over the fact that I hadn't met you before this and of course thank you to all of the show's patrons if you would like to get early access to all of the episodes as well as a bunch of bonus stuff then you can by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black and of course thank you to everybody listening I'm Sasha Black, you are listening to Amy Mertz, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm going to be joined by uh, somebody who I'm super excited to uh, interview, Crystal Sutherland. Now, Crystal is a traditionally published young adult author uh, of some of my favourite books. And I recently had the opportunity to read one of her arcs and uh, interview her. So we are going to be talking all about character creation, side characters, atmosphere, um, using the senses in your writing and all of that good stuff basically how to be a better writer. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.